It's very brightly colored and it's very loud and it's fun for a while. We want to be free to, to do what we want to do. We're Muhammad Ali and Sonny Barger, the president of Hells Angels. This is 109.5. Okay, Mother, we are live. Well, we're not live, we're recording. But um, how are you doing? <laughs> good, I'm well, thank you. And you? Yeah, I'm really well. And yeah, really good. I wanted to chat to you about your book, of course. So firstly, congratulations on a, on, a, on a really successful event last night. I just watched some of the recording, which was, um, it's, I think there were 70 plus people. So um, yeah, I obviously couldn't join live because it was three in the morning, but um, it looked like it was a real success and I flicked through it. But uh, yeah. It looked yeah, like it, went it, was, well. it was three o'clock. It was three o'clock in the morning, Matt. So I'm sorry, but I'll, I do actually know that had had you been uh, had you wanted to watch England play rugby, you probably would have got up at three o'clock in the morning. But to get up at three o'clock in the morning and watch your mum launch a book is probably, yeah, I understand. I, I <laughs> Quite possibly. It. I mean, I can't really argue that one because you've seen me get up at ridiculous times watching rugby. But that is on a Saturday night. This, of course, was during the week. But anyway, I'm glad it was. Uh, thanks for letting everyone know that. But um, look, I'm glad it was a success and it was good to see a few familiar faces there. And and um, yeah, look, I wanted to do this because I've got some people in this part of the world, actually, who've been asking about the book and friends and and nice to just give them a bit of a snippet of, you know, what it's about and 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 how they can get hold of it and stuff. So, of course, we can see the the Dear Tosh kind of sign behind you. And it's it's yeah. a memoir. Do you want to just give us a bit of a snapshot? What what you know, what is it? You know, what's the book? What's yeah, it all well, about? Yeah, of course, it's a it's a memoir. It was probably 10 years in the making but really only came together last year and over the period of November to February the 1st uh, 2020 to 2021 because that actually he died on 14th of January 2011 so this year was the 10th anniversary and I've written it and finished it as a tribute to him um, and I think it's worked really well because it's I've done it as 27 letters that's why it's called Dear Tosh 27 letters for 27 years of his life. And I've self-published the book. The reason I self-published was because I wanted to get it out in time. I wanted it to be out soon after I'd finished it. And if you go the traditional route, you have to get an agent and a publisher, then editors, and it just takes ages. It takes forever, even if you do get picked up, which isn't always uh, gonna happen because it's a, it's a very competitive uh, business, memoir, writing, any kind of writing. But um, I did it, and I'm really, really pleased with the result, which is here. This is the book. Oh, it looks, it looks good. Of course, I've seen it, and we all, you know, the whole family was kind of giving feedback on the, the design process and, and stuff. But that, and that photo, of course, there's a story behind that. You want to share what that photo is, because it's a great photo and a great cover. Yeah, I, abs I mean, I absolutely love the cover. I'm so pleased with it. Uh, it was taken in December 2010. Yeah, December, December 2010. It's actually Christmas Day. So it's quite, that's why there's nobody there, I think. And it's uh, snowy. So it's Montpellier Station in Bristol. And Tosh has just actually, Tosh has just done some graffiti up here on a bit of concrete place. And he's running away from it. And his brother Wills is on the, <coughs> is on, on the bridge and he just snapped the photograph. And of course, Wills is a professional photographer, but I think it's just perfect. Yeah. And he, and uh, Wills and his twin brother, Joe, were there and with Tosh. And that Christmas was, in fact, the last time they saw him alive. So there's an awful lot to this, to this cover, an awful lot to this picture, which is, it means a lot to the family. And I think it's perfect. It's a perfect cover for the book. Yeah, it looks, I mean, it, obviously a lot of meaning in that photo and, and um yeah, nice kind of connection to the whole kind of yeah. to the other brothers and stuff. So yeah. what what was the um I'm gonna get you to read a bit in a, in a minute if 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 you can, which I think will be nice. But actually just you mentioned self-publishing. It's like what was that that whole journey of self-publishing? What's that been like? I mean, did you you decided because you wanted to get it done faster? And these days actually loads more people self-publish books, right? But it I know it's been a headache, right? It's not the easiest thing to do. <laughs> It's not, it's not because but at the end of the day, everything is down to you, everything. So you have to make sure that you, you get it right. And uh, actually I didn't get completely everything right. There's a few typos and things wrong in the book, but I, I'm not bothered about that. It's not there. I'm not going to get it marked. I mean, I've just, I have spent the year before last or last year doing um, an MA in creative writing. So I know 
I had to keep telling myself this wasn't going to be marked by a tutor and not to worry about it. This is a tribute to Tosh for his the 10th anniversary. And I'm quite sure he wouldn't care uh, how many spelling, well, there's no spelling mistakes, but how many things might be slightly wrong in it. Um, but yes, yeah, self-publishing is, it's not easy, it's costly. And I didn't actually want to go directly through Amazon, which you can do. I wanted to do it as close to the traditional route as possible. In other words, I used a proper, you know, I used a printer and I had it typeset. And then it's it's um, traditionally being distributed by a distributor throughout. And it, it's now everywhere. From yesterday, which was the publication date, you can buy it through Amazon. You can order it from your local bookshop if you're local to England. You can buy it almost anywhere. But of course, it takes rather a long time to get to somewhere like Thailand. It definitely does right now. So, but I will look, I mean, I'm, I've read parts of it already, obviously, but I'm looking forward to, so it comes in, you can get the ebook, you can get the, yeah. the, the, the paperback version that you've got there. Yeah. And then there's also the, what you call it? The, the, audio. the, the audio book, which you've done. Is that, when is that available? Which I'm really well, looking it, forward to hearing. It's ready to be uploaded now, but I was uploading it yesterday and to one of the platforms that you have to do it to. And they said the files had to be named in a certain way. So I, you know, this is what you happen when you self-publish and start everything. You're like, oh, for goodness sake. So I had to kind of start all over again. But fortunately, the guy who did all the mastering of the tapes, when I told him, he did it all for me. So after the launch last night, when I was looking at my emails, I'd had an email saying, oh, I've done it all for you. So I was like, oh, brilliant. Something else I don't have to worry about. Yes, good old Richard Hughes. <laughs> oh, cool. Well, I'm looking, well, I'm, looking at, I'm looking forward to the audiobook version. So um, I've I've got four or five or three or four questions from friends I've got written here. But actually, before I ask those questions, do you want to give us, I know on your event last night, you read out parts of the book. Is there a bit you can read and, you know, just yeah, to, to think, give a bit yeah. of a, a bit of a, you know, insight into the book? Uh, yeah, because obviously um, it's about, it's about losing Tosh. You know, your brother, he, he died uh, in Portugal because he had an accident. And there's a lot in the book about, grief and loss and but there's also a, a lot of other stuff as well but I talk about lots of things but I'm going to read chapter eight which is um uh the 13th of the the, the date on on the letter is the 13th of January 2021 which of course is 10 years later and I'm thinking back to what it was like 10 years before I'll just read a short bit dear Tosh last night I kept thinking about you and what you might have been doing 10 years ago at this time you would have been at the airport waiting to board the plane to Porto. I sat on the sofa trying to focus on a TV programme, but all I could see were images of you walking through the gate, backpack swinging, your earphones plugged in, listening to some music on your phone. There was probably a bit of a bounce in your step, even though you were nervous about flying. You had almost cancelled the trip because you didn't want to fly. And all, I also think you were nervous about socialising and not having a drink. You spoke to Jeff and me not long before you went to Porto. And we both told you not to go if you weren't sure. We should have been more definite in our advice. You also had trouble getting to the airport by all accounts. Missed buses, confused instructions about meeting up. I wish now that I'd reached out, told you not to go. Turn back, go home to Exeter, I should have shouted. Like I should have called my dad back and give him those bloody sweets. Last night I could see my boy innocent of the events that would occur in less than 18 hours. The emotions were swilling, churning up my stomach and in my head, and to control them for a while, I allowed myself the indulgence of imagining it hadn't happened. I often do that, but I can't make it last. I can only make it last for a few seconds. I woke up at seven this morning, and my first thoughts were, this time ten years ago, Tosh was already sleeping, and I didn't know, but I was about to find out. I began to relive the hours following that first phone call, the call that was going to change everything. The moment I knew you had been in an accident, I recall now how my thoughts raced around. It took a while for me to process the information and for it to sink into my stupid head. At first, I was not registering how bad things were. Joe rang us in the early hours of Thursday morning. It was so early I hadn't heard my mobile phone ringing as I'd left it in the kitchen. Only when I got up at seven and walked through to the bathroom did I see four missed calls and a text message. Mum, can you ring me now, please? It had been left at 5.30 in the morning. I thought that it might be about you, and I imagine Joe was having a problem with you because you were having an episode. That's what we called it for when, for some reason, you drank too much and the other tosh came out. But then I thought, you'd been so much better, no alcohol for four or five months, and you were attending counselling sessions, this time with someone you felt confident with and who made sense to you. It couldn't be you. It must be Joe. 
up to some stupid practical joke that had backfired, so he was calling me from a police cell because he needed rescuing. Mind you, Joe often sent can you ring me now texts, and mostly it would be something trivial he wanted to know, the rules of a card game, how to cook pasta or answer, the, to, or answer to the quiz question. But it transpired that Joe wasn't ringing about any of those things. He was phoning to tell us that something dreadful had happened to you in Porto. Wow. So, yeah, I mean, I should explain that the reason I wrote the bit about I, earlier in the book, I, I talk about my father's death. My father died in 1963 in a car accident. And before he went out of the house, he was messing about with me because he'd given me a packet of sweets and I wouldn't let him have any. And for years afterwards, I kept thinking I should have called him back and, and let him have another sweet because if I'd done that, he wouldn't have left the house when he did. But of course, we always think that it's a guilt thing, isn't it? When somebody, something happens, you immediately feel guilty and think you could have helped, you know, you could have stopped it happening. I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Like I, I can, obviously we've, you know, we've spoken about this and as you read that, I mean, obviously memories for me that are different, but completely related, but, um, you know, I, hearing you read it, it's, I, I can't help but think this book will be really useful to so many people who've been through the same types of situations of which I know on your journey, You've met many of those people now, right, who have very, very different stories, all tragic in their own way. But, um, you know, your kind of strength in, in sharing this, I think, is it can be really useful to other people who maybe are not so um, strong, maybe not the right word, but, you know, don't want to share in the same way, but can take so much from hearing other people's stories, your story and in, in how you've dealt with that. Uh, is there a lot in terms of the book? Does it deal a lot with your grief? Does it kind of expose how you dealt with the grief or does it really just kind of talk more to your relationship with Tosh? Uh, it does both. It does everything because um, there was, there was a lot of grief and there was a lot of stuff that I had to come to terms with, particularly I found the organ donation thing, which is also mm. written about in the book. And uh, yeah, it happened in Portugal. So it was in a country that we didn't, we couldn't speak the language. I never really had any counseling for anything, you know, for grief counseling or anything. I didn't want to take any antidepressants because it, it, it says in the book, you know, I wasn't depressed. I was just grieving. I just something I had to get through. And your whole life changes when you lose a child. It's something that only other people who have lost children can really understand it, I think. Um, but yes, uh, I hope it will help people. And I hope it will help people think, well, maybe I should write about something that's happened because writing about something is, is great, you know, it is cathartic and it is very therapeutic. You can write, it doesn't even matter if you just write it for yourself and you're never going to share it. It's, it's a really good way of helping you get through things. I found it. So, yeah. Cool. Well, look, I've got a couple of questions from friends. Let me just grab them here. So, um, and let me just, what shall I pick here? I've got kind of a few questions. I'll pick a couple out that seem good. Yeah, what did you, what did you learn about Tosh, about your son in writing this book? It's an interesting question because mm. Tosh obviously hasn't been around for 10 years. So, you know, in writing it's, it's, it's more about itself, but yeah, it's, I think it's an interesting question. Yeah, what did you learn about Tosh as you're writing um, this book? I if suppose, anything, I don't not, know. It's not, yeah, it's not so much learning about Tosh it's learning about my relationship with him and perhaps things that I didn't do in the right way when he was younger or th you know, there's a, there's a lot of stuff because he had an old, a much older dad um, that comes into it. And I, I suppose I just thought about what it might've been like from his point of view. So yes, I learned about that, but also I talked to his friends. So I was able to find out stuff from his mm. best friends um, which I've included in the book in a way I've tried to bring it in. It, it's, it's a, it's a hard one to answer how much, yeah, you think, you know, your kids, but you don't really, it's like, it's the, it's the same for my dad. I, you know, I was 13 when my dad died. So I never really knew him as an adult. Cause as a 13 year old child, you don't really have that relationship with your father. And Tosh was 27, but he'd left home a while before that. But I think it's, you know, your relationship grows over the years. And I, I don't know, it's a hard question to answer. I think it made me think about him anyway, and his character and what he was like. But it also made me feel I could have done perhaps more to help him. What about how your, how his death, has it changed how you look at life, look at life and death in terms of, um, you know, his passing and, and then, you know, maybe oh, over the last yeah. 10 years? Uh, it, it certainly makes me 
recognize my own mortality and that mm. I'm going to go and that you can actually go at any time. And I think I'm more accepting of that now. Um, I don't, it, yeah. It's, it's that you're asking me some very deep questions here. <laughs> that I, it, yeah, it's, it's made me think about that. It's made me think about my mortality and it's made me think more about death. So, which is probably a whole big other subject because I personally, I don't, I'm not a religious person and I probably think that at the end is the end, but that I don't feel that, uh, that Tosh is anywhere. He's just here. He's here. He's in my heart and he's in our family. And because we keep talking about him and I've written this book about him, we're keeping him alive. We're keeping him with us. But that doesn't mean to say I think he's looking over my shoulder. Not really. I, I love know. that. I mean, I really like I think we're very similar like that as mother and son. I mean, I think my philosophy would be much the same. And it's interesting that you say that. I think when I was watching the event, I think someone else asked something where you were talking about when you're writing, you kind of felt like he was there as you're mm. writing. So it's interesting when you say that, because it sounds mm. like a very kind of spiritual well, it's spiritual it, wrong word because it is spiritual, but it sounds like a kind of religious thing to say, almost like you believe in an afterlife. But you didn't mean that, right? You just no, feel that you're bringing him into life by sharing so much. Is, is that yeah. the right kind of way to say it? Yes, it is. And also it, writing the letters to him, I felt as though I was spending time with him, if you like, because I really believed that I was writing to him and telling him all these things. But I know I'm not. You know, I, it's like any book, isn't it? If you read a good mm. book, you get into it, you believe in the characters and you feel that they're with you. And I think that's what it was like. I felt like Tosh was there with me while I was writing to him and explaining things. You know, I, I say things, oh, do, do you remember this? Or just just talking to him, really. And I do talk to him quite a lot. I talk to my dad and my mum. But, you know, I don't get any response ever. <laughs> well, hopefully, you know, hopefully he does, you know, hopefully he doesn't give you bad feedback on the book, but we'll see. So, yeah. Oh, hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully. Well, look, um, yeah, I mean, my, actually, my question here is what, you know, what's next? I mean, well done. You've written a book at 70. Freaking, you know, well, I mean, I know you don't want to share your age on the podcast, but anyway, but um, well, I'm pretty, pretty proud. You've gone to uni. You've gone to uni in the last, what, two years. You've got an MA yeah. in creative writing. You've written a book. I mean, you know, that is pretty cool stuff. So, yeah, apologies to mention your age, but I think it's so, you know, I'm it's kind so of nice. proud that you've managed to to do all that in, in, you know, in, in this time over the last few years. So, and this is your first book. What's next? Presumably you're going to write some more, are you? Well, yeah, I'm going to, I've got a lot I want to write actually. Um, I thought, you know, I'd like to write about, uh, it, it's nice to leave it for the family too. So I, I thought I probably should write about um, my first marriage and stuff like that, you know, how I got into that and how I got out of it. Um, that'll be interesting. <laughs> Yeah, well, that would be, you know, that would basically be for you and Emily, I suppose. So that could also be a series of letters. I might write, you know, Dear Matt and Emily. Um, but the very next book is going to be a lot, something a bit lighter. So I'm going to write about my eight years living in Italy and how I came to be there and Jeff, going with Jeff, et cetera, and all that stuff, because it'll be fun to write. That will be fun. I've already fun. got yeah. quite a few chapters. I'm not exactly sure how I'm going to format it. It won't be letters, but um, I do have a little idea, which I'm not quite ready to share yet. But once I get the idea of, the structure of the book um i'm away i've written a few bits of it already written quite a bit cool well i haven't read this one yet i'm looking forward to it and i will read it in the next <laughs> couple of weeks and i look forward to reading the the, the next edition of whatever it is so yeah. for anyone who wants to i if, who wants to learn more about the book about you who wants to order the book what's the where's the best place for them to go to, to learn more well, i guess they better they probably better look on amazon but also i do have a very nice website thanks to your the help of you and some so um they can take a look at the website which is it's my name so ninettehartley.com if you google that i think it comes pretty much straight up um so you can read a little bit more about the book i can't if you live in the uk you can actually order it through that website but i can't really post them out um abroad so i think amazon's the best bet really and of course you can download it as an ebook we're anywhere in the world now that's available on Amazon and on Kobo. I feel like I'm trying to sell the book and well, that is the I, point. <laughs> yeah, so, I, think, right, I mean, cool. I, I, you know, to be honest, I've written it for, for myself and for the family and for people to share and for other mothers, you know, the dedication yeah. in the front says to all mums who have lost, lost a child at whatever age. So I have done that. So if I never sold any, I suppose it wouldn't be the end of the world, but I mean, nice that's, to pay for that's, it. 
that's the great thing about artistic pursuits, I suppose. You know, and I know, you know, you've done this because it's something you really want us to do. And great. Yeah. If, and it was, you know, good to see such a community around you last night of people and your brother was on there and I saw some other familiar faces, friends from the UK. So that was really nice to see that. So, I mean, that's what it's all about. Great. If it sells and hopefully, yeah. you know, I'm sure it will and people will give you feedback. So it's, um, yeah, well done. So, um, yeah, cool. I'm proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Matt. All right. Next time I'll try and do the launch so it's not three o'clock in the morning for you, okay? Yes, thank you very much. All right, Mum. Best of luck. Love okay. you. Talk to Bye. you soon. Bye. Love Bye. Love you too. Bye. A Day in the Life. Beatles medley for Tosh. Hello. Goodbye. Let it be. Yesterday you had all my loving. I don't know where you are, but eight days a week I'm crying. Yesterday you had all my loving. Perhaps it won't be long. But eight days a week I'm crying, locked in a sad song. Perhaps it won't be long. Do you want to know a secret? I'm locked in a sad song. The memories I can't separate. Do you want to know a secret? Money can't buy me love. I know the memories I can't separate. I feel fine. You're not here, though. Money can't buy me love. I know I get by with a little help from my friends. I feel fine. You're not here, though. I imagine you to be at Rainbow's End. I get by with a little help from my friends, but I don't know where you are. Did you ever find strawberry fields? Hello. Goodbye. Let it be.